welcome uh, those of you who are with us in person and those of you who will be watching this uh, after the fact. Uh, my name is David Greenberg. I'm with my colleague, Heather Wendling. We'll introduce ourselves a little more fully here in a moment, but we are talking about effective continuity of learning plans um, and how those serve schools, students, and authorizers well. So thank you so much for joining us. We want to add a little bit of context uh, to the sort of brief session overview that we provided in the, in the conference platform. So obviously, as everyone knows, you know, the country is in essentially chaos and it's affecting a lot of children and families uh, disproportionately based on things like demographic, geography, you know, et cetera. So um, since March, really, you know, everyone in education has really been buckling down and trying to figure out how do we best surf kids through, you know, through these um, really difficult times and how do we prevent learning loss that is sure to result especially around those those you know, that I just mentioned that are really, really vulnerable and those that are hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, so all this, this seems limiting and there are so many families and students that are that are reeling in multiple ways. Um, when we talk about those, we're generally talking about students of color, students from low-income families or students that are economically disadvantaged, those that have disabilities and language learners. Although, as you'll see in our resource that we're gonna talk about, uh, we, we talk about vulnerable populations very broadly because um, that is a very sort of elastic definition right now. So our sort of thesis and the real, you know, the real um, reason behind this session um, is that we as sort of coaches to authorizers from NAXA feel that it's really mission critical for authorizers and school operators to work together to develop continuity of learning plans that are going to help school operators and staff and teachers and families and ultimately kids navigate all of these transitions, challenges, and possibly you know, come out on the other side better, stronger. Heather, why don't you um, introduce yourself a little bit more fully? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so as I said, my name is Heather Wenling, currently the Director of Learning at NAXA, which is a national nonprofit that supports charter school authorizers founded upon the idea that if authorizers are making really meaningful, well-intentioned, well-evidenced um, decisions and practices, then that will help charter schools thrive, you know, even during normal times and during the current times. Uh, before I joined NAXA about four years ago, my uh, career was essentially split between working in classrooms uh, with, with teachers and other staff First as a special education teacher, um, special education intervention coach, and then switched over and worked as an authorizer for several years. So we mentioned that, and David is also going to um, describe a little bit of his background as well, because we have been on both sides of that table. You know, both worked at independent charter schools, both have the authorizer perspective, um, and that's one of the reasons why this work was really interesting and intriguing and we think is a lever for, for everyone to succeed. And hello again, my name is David Greenberg, Director of Leadership Development at NAXA. Been here coming on two years. And uh, prior to that, I also worked as an authorizer at the Audubon Center of the North Woods in Minnesota, now called Osprey Wilds, authorizes 35 or so, all really independent, charter schools in Minnesota. And prior to that, I was a founding teacher um, at El Colegio Charter School in Minneapolis. We opened our doors in 2000, and I was a teacher there, a social studies teacher. El Colegio is a high school. I also taught special ed and many, many things. Ultimately was the director of the school and did everything between cleaning up uh, the puke in the hallway to uh, working on refinancing, you know, million dollar, multi-million dollar bonding for our facilities. Um, and as Heather alluded to, um, I very much uh, understand what it is to be in the role of a school leader. Um, I can't say uh, I, I've been in a situation like many of you have experienced over the past six to eight months. Um, but I, I deeply uh, have a lot of empathy and respect for all the work that you all have been doing. Um, 
so yeah, as, as Heather shared, we've been on both sides of, of, of the line as school leaders, as authorizers. Mm -hmm. And part of what we want to try to do is, is help you think a little bit more about what authorizers, what goes on in authorizers' heads as well, and share with you from our national perspective what, what we've been talking about with authorizers around the country as it relates to uh, continuity of learning. Yeah. One of the one of the things that we bring from Naxa, um, and I think that makes Naxa somewhat unique, and it doesn't always come across because we don't always have many audiences that are uh, that are full of school leaders, school operators, and school level staff, is that our foundation of best practice is built upon authorizers not requesting any additional information from schools. They're not going to utilize to evaluate or, you know, in, in sort of the current times, right? It's not only evaluate, but it's also find ways or systems or connecting schools or the resources for support. Um, so hopefully that also comes across as we talk through our development process and the resulting tool that we think serves both authorizers and schools really well. Can we find out who's in the room, David? Um, sure. Let's see. Let me back up. We have a small but mighty viewers up here. It's still interesting to hear about, you know, their, their context, their schools. Here we go. So um, it seems that our interactivity in this platform is pretty limited to the chat box. So we're trying to get comfortable in there. If you, everyone can, uh, we have your name. Uh, if you can also just include your school organization, maybe where you are in the country, your role, and then share with us something that your school is doing really well right now. Something that you're proud of. Give you about 20 seconds for All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's um, talk about our themes here a little bit, Heather. Great. So at Maxa, we do a lot of tool development. We also do a lot of surveying the field, and our field is typically can, uh, comprised mostly of authorizers, some of whom authorize hundreds of schools across an entire state. Uh, others authorize maybe one school in a small in a small district and and all that in between. So whenever we are looking to fill a, a gap or a niche in the field or you know provide a tool or a template that authorizers have kind of requested um, in order to enhance their capacity to do their work well, we start off by you know asking folks you know to understand more of the flavor or the parameters of what would really be helpful so in the spring we did um a randomized survey that was you know went out to a representative cross-section of authorizers across the country and asked very basic questions about you know what they were worried about with their schools during the pandemic if you know finances were top of mind and then asked questions around what they had or what they were thinking about requiring in terms of continuity learning plans so some folks, uh, you know, some states required this. So the SEA was the one that led on it. Others, you know, other um, more independent or smaller authorizers had to figure out very quickly and early on what they wanted to ask for, what they wanted to require, and what they were going to do with that information. You know, were they going to hold schools accountable in some way? Uh, were these really just to guide conversations? And we got responses that included all of that and more. Um, a little bit quantitatively, we um, our survey results suggested that about 75% of authorizers by late spring had asked schools for some level of continuity of learning plans, 
but the contents really, really varied. Some of them were very compliance driven. Um, some of them were very, very in depth. Some of them were not at all. Um, and that also obviously left about 25% of authorizers that had not required this. Uh, so we saw that it was a need, you know, to issue a guidance or a tool because we did feel that this was a really a quickly emerging best practice. And we wanted our continuity of learning plan sort of template or guidance. We wanted it to go far beyond compliance. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that in each step of the, the way that the process for for developing and codifying and chronicling this, you know, these practices was something that was being done in collaboration with schools, not just another requirement. So on our side, our priorities going into this work were that we knew that the tool had to be really versatile. We wanted it to be comprehensive. We wanted it to be as equitable and inclusive for all school types, staff types, leader types, student types, geography, context, all of those things. And we also wanted it to be aspirational because even back in the spring or the early summer, nobody knew how long the situation was going to last. So we wanted it to be something that would be substantial enough to grow with schools. And we wanted to make sure that this entire, you know, that the tool, we weren't even really sure what it was going to look like at first, but we wanted to make sure that the, this guidance was not going to seem like it was an edict from the ivory tower. Uh, so we involved some really great stakeholders for input into this development. So to make sure that this was going to be applicable to authorizers and, you know, helping them develop the questions to ask and school operators and hopefully having a process that was both reflective and useful and elastic, as I said, we wanted to make sure that it was easy to differentiate and adapt. So in, you know, as, as a, we see here in this clip art, thought of really this as a, a Swiss Army knife that, you know, did a little bit of something for everyone. And as our audience, as we mentioned, is not typically directly school leaders and school staff, we engaged a really talented group of consultants out of Ohio, um, led by Mark Comanducci. He runs the 305 Education Group. So he was able to pull together instructional leaders, uh, experts in social emotional learning and hybrid learning, you know, to make sure that this felt authentic and would apply for schools across the domains that we ultimately identified as being best practice. We'll share his contact info or their, their website later on. If anyone has any specific needs, they'd want to reach out to him highly recommend them a lot. So here I'm going to pause and I'm going to give everyone just a few moments to read through this and sort of sit with them and see how they resonate with you. Uh, these were the sort of foundational beliefs upon which our approach and ultimately the guidance and the domains and the sub indicators and all of those things are built around. So I know that the chat function here, it seems to be there's a slight delay. I hope it's not either my or David's internet connection. But if we can give this a shot, anyone, any of our attendees, if you can enter into the chat, which of these kind of foundational beliefs maybe resonates with you or challenges you, we'd just love to see you know, if, if anybody had any strong reaction to any of these. Okay, well then I will share the one that resonates both with me. Um, if we were gonna sort of number these, I think number five 
um, in the scheme of, of acknowledging and respecting all of the additional tasks and challenges and pressures that school operators and staff and, and authorizers as well have faced during the pandemic. Um, and the fact that the, the situation is consistently evolving and it's really hard to predict when things can go back to quote unquote normal. The fact that we, uh, you know, the NAXA team and then also our, our sort of consultant partners approached this as an iterative process, um, that it's something that cannot really be done all at once if it's going to be something that's really responsive and reactive over the course of potentially another school year. Um, the fact that this is implemented in stages, and as we'll see in a little while, you know, sort of the way that the, the template and the questions and the indicators are all presented and, you know, how they can be adapted is really something that builds upon and helps to drive ongoing improvement. That's one of the major, that's one of the major strengths I, I see of this tool and this approach. So we'd love to hear more from our attendees, um, but also, you know, um, recognizing that there will be people perhaps that review this, uh, this recording after the fact, you know, can also share a little bit of what we've been hearing nationally, you know, from our touch points with authorizers and, and their schools. Nax has been hosting a lot of community conversations, you know, sort of weekly or biweekly since, since the, the early spring when this all happened. And those are really great opportunities to convene with various stakeholders to, so we have, we have some thoughts about some of these things. Yeah, so I, I'm seeing some, some chat come in very sort of uh, delayed, uh, it seems, but, but please, uh, please take a moment to um, respond to one or, or more of these prompts. One thing that I, I would say is that um, Heather, we've we've talked a lot about this at, at our shop. Is just the the how author, many authorizers are seeing their role in a more supportive lens. Um, you know, over the last say eight months than perhaps they did in the previous eight months. Yep. Um, particularly when the when the pandemic came out, uh, you know, really rolled out and really started to impact all of our communities. It was sort of an all hands on deck kind of approach. And um, in some ways, I think this continuity of learning guidance is, is part of that, right? So this was really meant um, less as a um, compliance task and much more of a let's, let's all help each other think about this stuff because mm -hmm. we all want to do what's right for kids. Yeah. What are some things you, you, you heard that you want to share? I'm asking you, Heather. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by the chat because like six. Oh, six, you're seeing some. It's coming in all at once. That's um, awesome because I'm not seeing it. So my my chat is very delayed. So um, yeah, I think just to build on to build on what you had said about hearing what you know from authorizers is maybe backing away a little bit from that from the the regulator you know sort of um, role that some. Um, generally take or you know feel feel required to take and getting very human um you know weekly phone calls and check-ins and you know it was uh authorizers even saying they would call to check in with school leaders and like you know data and stuff like never came up like there was very much sort of an emotional mental wellness check-in um and authorizers that were in a position to maybe, you know, make connections with community resources and, you know, especially those in kind of larger urban districts, you know, got really in the in the trenches with folks in terms of, you know, feed, feeding plans and trying to get, um, you know, consistent Wi-Fi or community hotspots or things, you know, so we heard a huge variety of ways that authorizers, you know, um, sort of seamlessly filled in that support, that support role. Heather, could you read a couple of the comments? Cause I just can't see them. Yeah, um, so uh, they, it, it does seem like we're maybe on like an eight, eight or so minute delay. Um, early on, Darren from Utah was talking about his school. Um, he's from the, he's the superintendent or the chief academic officer of Utah's military academy. 
you said their in-person learning is really solid. Online and blending is about 21% of their total enrollment and they are rocking it. Um, then, so I believe this was thinking about the way that he designed their school's continuity of learning plan. They designed it with all consist consist yeah, constituencies in mind, um, as well as operations and things. Um, okay. All right. Great. So who knows what we who knows what will pop up in the chat? It seems like Great. it's going to surprise us. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's uh, let's press on. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So how informed do you feel about your authorizer's priorities right now? Oh, okay, press. Okay, we can press on. Yeah, let, let's go. Okay, great. So we're going to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of the the tool that, you know, sort of is the is that's undergird this session and of course which we're going to share with you. Um, but just to kind of set a frame and some additional information about that before we we're going to post a link to the file in the chat. Um, in the process of developing this, and as I said, working with a lot of experts from a lot of different angles, um, you know, that that provided their expertise, and we kind of saw where those, um, you know, sort of were interdependent and that related to each other. We ultimately decided that these were the five most critical domains that covered most of the learning experience. So I will say, you will not see operational, logistic, you know, health health things um, in this resource. You will see some of the operational and the infrastructure pieces as it relates to instruction, obviously. Uh, but, you know, the stuff about reopening the physical buildings and health concerns and all of that stuff, we know we felt that that was very well covered elsewhere. Um, so we stuck to more of the, the continuity of the actual teaching and learning. Um, so what you see here is these five domains we see them as very interdependent, not hierarchical, which is why they're not, you know, numbered or anything. Um, we couldn't say that one of these is more important than the other. Although obviously, you know, as as um, as prior authorizers, the student learning piece, you know, really jumps out at us. But all of these other domains also really support that. And without them, we also don't think student learning would be very effective during a pandemic. Um, so our tool that we're going to share with you is really built around these five domains. And the way that the guidance is structured, as I mentioned before, we wanted this to be equally as useful for authorizers and school operators. So we looked at, we approached this pretty differently. As I mentioned, those five domains that are standalone but interdependent, each of those has a separate purpose statement. You know, why in the scheme of things this matters? And we tried to be very disciplined and purposeful about, about those selections because we did not want to put any additional burdens on school operators or anyone at this time. So if it wasn't mission critical, it was cut out. Uh, we included a vulnerable student and an equity and access um, section within each of the domains. Some of these you'll you will see if you do a you know, if you read through this document, it reinforces the common thread that there are, are you know certainly at risk populations that need extra attention, but then also vulnerable students like that that um, that bucket is broadened immensely during a pandemic. So just making sure that we that we sort of catch or address all kids. Um, that are that are being impacted disproportionately now. Um, equity and access guidance is to embed measures that just you know sort of look for and make sure that you know new systems and routines and expectations are being really as most inclusive as possible. Which, as everyone on the call probably knows, during remote learning, really rife for in, in uh, inequality and inequity. So we spent a lot of time thinking deeply about how we could potentially guide people, you know, to mitigate those instances. One of the really powerful things here is the potential misconceptions also in every domain. There's things even around adult learning, you know, that, um, that may not be um, something that people would think of, you know, but could definitely impact the quality and the sustainability of ongoing continuity of learning. And then we have 
within each of these domains, like, you know, including student learning, there's either six to 10 focus areas within each of those domains. So it sort of narrows the focus um, to help develop a guiding question in each of those, which could be, you know, this if, if authorizers were gonna pick up this tool and say, hey, we didn't do a continuity of learning template yet, or we did one and it wasn't really robust and it didn't measure what we wanted to measure, or it wasn't useful to schools to prepare because it just wasn't in sync with the way they were thinking about programming or the way that they were planning around challenges. This is something that authorizers can use and sort of adapt to their own context. But a step further than that is there are lists of questions within each of these subdomains that are expressly designed for schools, school operators, leadership teams, boards to grapple with as they figure some things out and then can push themselves to the next kind of stage, as we mentioned earlier, make sure that they are, you know, sort of attacking things in an order that feels right for them. It gets more specific and it gets more complicated, you know, as schools move forward and, and want to know kind of what's next. Heather, I put um, a link in the chat with uh, right. to, to this actual document. Why don't you do it as well, just in case it just seems sure. that the, the chat is a little delayed. You got it. Okay. So let's try this polling thing. Do you all do you all see polls? Let's see, how do I activate the poll? Oh. I think that I think I'm guessing that on next to the chat, there's the viewers, and then there's another three lines. I think yep. if you navigate to that, the poll is our is active. It's there. So folks can just go to the poll. I believe so. so Yep. So which of these things, we're going to spend a little time diving a little deeper with you. Which of the five domains would you like to take a closer look at? So if you can find the poll, uh, it's that top question. Uh, which, which one would you like to take a closer look at over the next 10 minutes or so with us? So take a minute to answer that poll. Again, Heather, yours seems to be more responsive than mine in terms of speed. So as you see those come in. Okay. And as folks are doing that, I'm actually going to try to change my screen. What happens if I do this, Heather? Do you see the continuity of learning plan come up? I sh yes, I do. Oh, perfect. That was easy. Easier than Zoom, even. <laughs> OK, so now, David, I have I answered both of the poll questions. But now I don't see results. Okay. If you do. I see. Uh, I see that adult support is actually the highest one. Okay, so let's take a look at that. I mean, one of the things that I think is helpful that makes this more user friendly is we did use a consistent approach in each of the domains. Um, so we can certainly get a little more into the detail of what the adult support domain includes specifically. Um, but then also knowing that for folks that might want to look at this again later or share this with colleagues or you know even use it as a template. Um, the content is different, but the structure is the same for the others. I wonder if we can make your screen a little bit bigger, David, or maybe not, perhaps not. So, okay, that helps. All right, so um, so the as I said, we have a purpose, you know, that that explains in a sort of succinct way why each of these domains is mission critical. Um, so specifically for adult support. We said the purpose of this is to identify new or modify existing beliefs, knowledge, skills, and actions required for the support and continuous improvement of educators and families. So this, in a nutshell, is how do we make sure that there are consistent communication patterns, supports in terms of um, emotional and also work-related professional development you know, for, for teachers and systems 
you know, for things like feedback, uh, you know, to, to try to make this a sustainable, very swift pivot for teachers that most of whom were never trained or supported or ever envisioned teaching in teaching in the way that they, they suddenly found themselves. So here we have under the vulnerable student guidance, you know, it really focuses on professional development to meet the needs of vulnerable students. Um, and if there are, you know, specific new pieces that teachers need explicit training on, or if there's explicit, you know, technology tools, you know, to meet specific um, differentiation needs, you know, those need to be a priority of the school operator. And they would include that in their plan to show the teachers are being set up for, set up for success. Um, the equity and access guidance um, is somewhat similar, but it talks about a cross section of, of stakeholders. And here you'll start to see one of those common threads through, you know, the tool. It does talk a lot about communication, about relationship, about soliciting feedback to know how things are going and what additional needs are there for students and teachers and, and you know, potentially families. Then at the bottom of the page here, we have, uh, as I mentioned, those misconceptions. Important for school operators and boards to visit these and sort of sit with these. The first one here um, is something that we, um, I would say, we're a little surprised by because often we skip right over the adults and we think about, you know, students and families. Do they have sufficient technology at home? Do they have Chromebooks? Do they have Wi-Fi that works? You know, what if there are multiple, you know, children in the home that are trying to use the same the same tech? You know, what what uh, complications exist there? But in those conversations, we could also, you know, sort of skip over the issues for staff that might also have some of those constraints at home. You know, we've heard we heard stories about teachers out in very rural areas um, that they had, you know, even even um, even weaker Wi-Fi or some of those things. Um, so just making sure that when you're assessing, you know, the infrastructure needs and the learning needs um, and the wellness needs of your students, making sure you extend that also to the adults in your communities as well. Okay. So here is an example. Um, so within the subdomain of adult support, it's broken down a little bit further into things like role definition, uh, families and non-school stakeholders, and things like teaming structures. So if authorizers and schools find that these subdomains are really useful and these are things that apply to specific schools based on, you know, sort of size model, you know, that type of thing. It gives an authorizer's guiding question, just to very open-ended, how is the school either planning to do X, Y, Z, or how is the school actively doing X, Y, Z? Um, and then based on that school response, the authorizer can, you know, sort of track that if it's something that the school is, is you know, already implementing, or if they identify it as a challenge or they plan to do it down the road, the authorizer has this as sort of a baseline to show where the school currently is and where they could be going. So this is useful information to have during authorizer check-ins, you know, sort of um, ultimately still a very open question what accountability will ultimately look like post pandemic, but having this information in hand at the authorizer, you know, over the course of the year while learning is really in this transitional hybrid space is really useful. What we think potentially is even more useful is for the schools to utilize these reflection prompts in each of these subdomains, you know, to work out in leadership team meetings and retreats and staff meetings or, you know, with their boards um, so that they have something that's really codified they can see where their strengths are to further leverage them. And then they could also identify, oh, that's something that we need to grow on. Or perhaps maybe that's something that's not applicable to us. But this could be used sort of as an adaptive roadmap for schools to sort of just build on these conversations and, these, and this planning as they get more immersed in some of these things. Can you scroll down a little bit, David? So here are two that are really important, and you'll see here how this does tie in very, very closely to the student learning domain overall. So teaming structures, you know, how are teachers collaborating? How are meetings facilitated? 
how do logistics change? You know, all of this is very, you know, has been, you know, for a lot of schools, very much developed or determined on the fly when buildings just suddenly closed and things are largely virtual. Um, you know, so these questions that schools can, you know, figure out really useful for staff to understand leadership expectations or for leaders also to consult teachers and staff around what works best for them or, you know, how will how will their time in in meetings or in team get togethers or collaboration, you know, does that does the the allotted time need to be different? Does the timing, you know, the, the time of day need to be different? Does the reporting up to leaders need to be different? These are all things that could really differ from one school to the next, but just asking these questions and sort of plotting it out and planning and just the, you know, the act of actually having this discussion and soliciting input from all the interested parties um, is really important. Similarly, around content delivery. You know, we have schools that are doing in-person instruction, schools that are doing fully virtual instruction, and then lots of schools that are doing a mixture of both. For professional development for teachers, whether they're an in-person, virtual, or hybrid, is that how they're going to be, you know, provided with PD or, you know, with meetings? And what barriers might exist to, to any of those, to any of those um, selections? So again, something that we hope that these questions, you know, that are based upon best practices of adult learning, you know, during um, during times of of inconsistent content delivery, what are you hearing from teachers um, that would help you react to them and support them well? Okay, so we'll leave this up a bit. I don't want to read more of this to you all. Yeah, and I think it's important to think, you know, as some districts are moving between in-person and remote learning, how do these questions um, and how does the thinking evolve mm -hmm. as, um, as we have to move between those, you know, either hybrid or fully in-person or fully, fully mm -hmm. uh, remote? Yep. Um, Heather, is there anything else we want to highlight in the actual tool? And again, hopefully, folks, you, you've got the link and you can access it and, and dive in more deeply uh, on your own time as well, of course. I think that the, and I think we've alluded to this already or probably said it, but I think it bears repeating, is that this, um, we call this a guidance or we call it continuity learning plan guidance more so than an evaluation template or something, right? Because it's not directive. We don't think, we think that there is still tremendous value in authorizers and schools using this, even if they only use the guiding questions. You know, like we think that there's just a lot of adaptabil adaptability that's built into each of these things. You know, and I think a lot of it has to do with realistic, realistic expectations around capacity. You know, some authorizers are, it's like half a person that they, you know, it's, they also do five other, you know, full-time jobs at a school district. Um, and also some of these schools are, you know, there's even, you know, micro schools or schools that are, that just opened last year and they're dealing with this, you know, um, right out of the gate. So just being realistic about capacity and context um, I think that's something that is particularly kind of unique around this around this template. Excellent. Well, let's let's uh, let's talk about kind of where we are right now. We've all uh, in the midst of of this pandemic. Of course, we just had some elections that uh, I think through some other sessions in this. Um, conference and, and maybe other things you've heard, of course, have implications on charter schools um, and on education and, and on the pandemic as well. So what are the implications of that for charter schools and these continuity of learning plans? Uh, I think we'd all love to hop into, or many of us would love to hop in a VW bus and just head for the hills. Um, yet we are still here to support kids, of course. So want to share with you some recent data about uh, remote learning that's coming from parents. So this is 
some surveys that were done by the National Parents Union, and you can see the link below at the bottom of this. Um, you just do a Google search for National Parent, Parents Union, and you'll learn more about them. But through a couple surveys uh, and polls that they've done nationally uh, over this fall, we can see, um, you can see the question here. If you could send a message to people who make decisions about education policy and public schools, which of the following do you think they should prioritize this school year? And we can see that, that a majority of parents, and that's actually gr slightly growing, uh, we also understand some of the limitations of polling, I think. But but providing access to consistent, high-quality, remote, or online learning for public school students this year is a very high priority uh, for the majority of families. A less, uh, about a third of families, a little over a third, think the priority should be to get public school students back into the classroom this year and implementing health and safety measures. So, so families in general, you know, it, it's not an overwhelming majority, but certainly a majority, a higher percentage are interested in ensuring consistent quality distance learning. Another poll, which I think starts to become even more interesting and compelling, is thinking about future years after the pandemic is over, we have a vaccine and things are moving towards quote unquote back to normal. Do you think schools should continue providing online or remote learning options for students that they are offering now, or that schools should go back to having all students attend school in person? And here we're seeing Almost 60%, 58% of, of parents of families are, are saying we should continue to provide online or remote learning options. Where about 37% are saying we should go back to fully in school. And we can see that um, for folks who are in person right now, if they have children who are attending in person, it's about a 50-50 split. And if they have uh, children who are attending remotely or online, um, that it's over 60%. Point being, this is something that schools should consider if they're responsive to their families and, and they should probably do their own polls uh, with their own families. Thinking about, is this something we wanna keep doing? And if so, um, your continuity of learning plan, having something that's really codified and that you can reflect on can help you Think about well, what are we doing well? What is working here? Mm -hmm. What do we want to change? Kind of this, we're in the midst of this massive action research project. You are in your schools. We are as a, as a country. And so take advantage of that to really um, document what you're trying to do, document what you actually do, and document how it's going, and then document the adjustments you make. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. what we all do teachers in the classroom, hopefully every day uh, and every week and every month. And this is something more systematically you can do as it relates to this remote learning, this distance learning, um, because there's a decent chance that this could continue um, in some way, shape or form past this current school year. Heather, any thoughts on that? No, I just actually really like, it's, it seems actually quite optimistic to think of all of this as one big formative assessment. It's a, <laughs> yeah. little, bit of a, a little bit of a mental boost. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's of course not to, uh, I've heard a couple of people say very, uh, very astutely, like this whole idea to, to uh, you know, make, make lemonade out of lemons and, you know, to see crisis as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, I mean, too many of, too, we all know too many people who, who have been sick and, and too many who've mm -hmm. passed away, including charter school leaders, charter school teachers, uh, family yeah. members, um, all of that. So this isn't, this isn't really about that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, we, we look into the future as educators and particularly as school leaders. And so this is something that we need to be prepared for. Yeah. Um, so really um, want to want to emphasize that idea. Use your continuity of plan, learning planning, a mm -hmm. uh, learning plan as a tool for for research um, about mm -hmm. how do we best support kids and families. 
So on a somewhat similar note, um, you know, again, we've got a, a president elect uh, and a new administration that will be coming in in the next uh, in, in two months. Um, and part of what's been happening uh, in the lead up to the elections is, is certainly discussion about school choice. Um, the, the, the incoming administration has had some rhetoric that has not been as friendly to charter schools or school choice. Um, but this is also an opportunity for us to really step up as a sector. So, so what I've got uh, on this slide are four or five sort of headlines, right? The, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools did, did some research with others to think, to, to see how are charter schools responding to, to uh, COVID? How is that uh, different from how districts are responding? And there's a couple other pieces here that you can see. And, and so far it's been somewhat mixed, but we have been hearing, and we all know that charters are agile. Charters mm -hmm. are more innovative. And what some of the data is showing is that charters have, have been able to use that agility and that innovation to focus more on things like student learning and, and actual teaching and learning happening, uh, student supports in a more personal direct way. Um, one of the things that, that charters haven't perhaps done or have done maybe slightly less well than districts, uh, depending on the schools, is, is ensuring things like hotspots or ensuring all students have access to um, online, quality online um, internet. Um, and we can see here that charter schools may be leading the way. I, I would love to see charter schools leading the way. And again, this continuity of learning plan and that action research can help you lead the way. It can help you document what you're doing well, what you're struggling with, what are the changes you're making, how are kids being served well, so that we can tell the world um, that charter schools are doing great stuff. I mean, this is our, this is our, um, our charge, I think, all the time. And again, as a charter school leader, um, in the past and as an authorizer, you know, that was something that I, I saw as really important. We couldn't just let the world happen around us. We had to show why we were unique and innovative and agile and how we served students uh, well and not, doesn't have to be better. It doesn't have to be to put down the, the district schools or the other options, but charter schools are a critical part of the education landscape today. And uh, I think what's happened over the last six to eight months is, is another uh, data point that shows that. So we have to show that, we have to say that um, in, in earlier rather than later, because the policies and the practices and the, the, uh, the secretaries of education and all these things are gonna be named sooner than later. So we gotta get the word on it. So use your continuity of learning plan as a tool to do that. Off my soapbox. Well, <laughs> um, any anything you want to add to that, Heather? No, that was perfect. Great. So we are um, coming. Come, we got a few minutes left here. Um, we saw. I see a little bit in the chat. Uh, Sonia is uh, saying uh, yes to the VW bus. I'm with you, Sonia. When you're ready to go, let me know. Love to join you. Uh, you can pick me up on your way out west. Um, so here's our contact information. If you want to follow up with us about anything, happy to talk. Um, happy to, again, give you that lens into kind of what's going on in, in authorizers' minds and how we are talking to authorizers. I'm also going to put in the chat the name. I just want to make sure that we um, connect folks to the consultant that really helped us figure out, you know, the, at, a, at a deep level, our domains and, you know, the specifics of these things. Um, if this would be helpful for anyone else, you know, any any schools or any other groups that might um, 
want to to pick his brain or the you know the brain trust of consultants that he was able to comprise for us. I'm going to put that in the chat too. So that's the 305 Education Group. Mm -hmm. And his name is Mark Kemenducci. So uh, yeah, as David said, here's our contact information. You know. If you take a look at this resource and you want to discuss any of it, especially if you want to discuss maybe adapting it or how you could use it in a particular situation, would love to thought partner with you and you know um, chat about it. And if any other, if you have any interest about anything else that Naxa is working on or Naxa's position on certain things, also the website qualitycharters.org uh, contains a lot of good stuff. And I just lost my power. So luckily that is not on my Wi-Fi, but it is on my little office here. So um, yeah, great. Thank you all for being here. And thank uh, you. And thank you for will... the work you do and take care. <laughs>